So good morning, Hollywood Community Church. It's good to see all of you. Um, if this is your first time joining us in worship, my name is Brad. I'm one of the pastors here at Hollywood Community Church, and I'd say a huge welcome to you if this is your first time. And we've been in a series called Live Generously, and uh, this week we're going to be speaking on a topic. Pastor Brian, the last two weeks, gave us some attributes of that should characterize our lives as Jesus' disciples, that the first week he talked about how we need to embrace unity, that each of us should seek unity above all with one another, but also in the world. And then the last week he spoke upon having humility, that humility has to be a mark of a disciple's life because Jesus great, demonstrated the greatest humility, who was king of kings, came down as one of us, gave up his kingly rights, and lived as one of us so that he could rescue us from sin and death and he demonstrated humility, and so should we. And today we're going to look at this idea that to live generously, we must embrace missional living. Everybody say missional living. Okay, now you might sit back and say, Brad, what does that mean? Well, we're so glad you're here. We're going to unpack that this morning. Now, I'm going to tell you uh, just a quick story about my father. During the Vietnam War, the U.S. had initiated a process called the draft process, and so Men that were not already active in the military or didn't enlist, they could be selected to go serve their country and go overseas to Vietnam. Well, my father, as a result of that process, he was selected to go into the United States Army. And so he goes to boot camp, and after passing boot camp and passing an officer school, he comes out as a sergeant in the U.S. Army. And upon graduation, my father received his orders to go to Long Bend, Vietnam, where he would receive his mission. So he travels to Long Bend, Vietnam, and he goes to the commander. The commander gives him his mission. I have a picture of him uh, that I will put on the screen there. There he is overseas in Vietnam during the war. Now, he got a mission from his commander. And if anybody who has ever been in the military or had somebody that was in the military knows somebody, each individual soldier does not get to make up their own mission, right? You can't decide, today my mission is to go home. That's not a mission. Imagine being in war if every soldier was allowed to make up their mission, what would be accomplished? Nothing. You see, in a war, everybody is given a mission so they all know what to do. During the Vietnam War, the mission was to defeat the communist Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese Army who were trying to establish communism in the country. So when my dad went to Vietnam, he was a part of that mission to stop that and he was given his orders. And every platoon, every soldier had to play their part in order to work the mission. Nobody could chase their own. They had to submit to the authorities above them and here's the mission, we're all going to do our part no matter what. Well, my dad told a story that there was one night where him and another uh, soldier in his unit got separated from the rest of the team. And so somehow a firefight broke out, they got separated, and they were stuck all night long, just them two. Now, if there wasn't a mission, that could have been the opportunity to say, hey, we're out of here, we're set free, bye, adios. They're away, we're gonna get out of this country. But they knew that they were on a mission. They knew that their unit was depending upon them to work towards that mission. So they didn't run away. They didn't make up a new mission. They stuck it out till daybreak, and they went back and found their unit. Why? Because they were a team. They were on a mission. They, their team needed them just as much as they needed their team. And so they stayed the course, and they stayed on mission. And then finally, after a year and a half, my dad came back to the United States after serving on his mission. Here's the truth this morning, and I share all that to say that each of us, the Apostle Paul calls us soldiers, uses soldier Im- imagery all the time. Ephesians put on the whole armor of God. All of us are soldiers in Christ, and as every soldier in any military, when you are sent on mission, you have your orders to carry out that mission, and that mission is not something that each of us individually come up with. We don't come up with our own mission. The mission that we are on doesn't belong to us. Rather, on the contrary, our mission is actually God's mission. You following me? Okay. So, from the beginning of Scripture, you see the mission of God unfold. God creates a beautiful world. God creates mankind. 
Man disobeys, falls into idolatry, and sin and shame is brought into the world. All of creation is tarnished. All of God's people are tarnished. Everything in the world is going wrong. There's fighting. Instead of there being love, joy, peace, happiness, self-control, you see the opposite. Hate, sorrow, conflict, sadness, people out of control, people living in chaos. So how does God make it right? Well, as you continue to read scripture, it is the mission of God that he seeks out to set everything back right the way he wanted it to be. So God the Father sends his son Jesus into the world to destroy the powers of idolatry, sin, and death. And by his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, all who believe in him will receive, all who repent and believe in him will receive forgiveness of sins. They will be set free from idolatry, sin, and death. And guess what? They will become righteous in God's eyes. Then after Jesus fulfills his mission, he sends the Spirit into the world to empower Jesus' disciples to convict people of their sin and bring them to salvation. Then you see the Spirit sends Jesus' disciples into the world to deliver the good news. Jesus Christ is Lord. Forgiveness of sins is found in him. You can be set free from sin, from idols, from idolatry, and you will receive eternal life. This is the mission each of us have been called upon. It's not our mission. It's not up to us for each one to figure out, okay, what mission should I be on? The mission is this, is to deliver the good news that Jesus is Lord and there is hope to overcome the sin and death that is in your life. You see, God has called us to join him as he restores creation and mankind. This morning, we're going to unlock two principles in the passage in Philippians chapter 2. So if you have your Bible there or have your phone, if you don't have either of those, it'll also be on the screen. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 18 this morning. And I'm going to read uh, those verses for us before we dig into the two principles. The Apostle Paul says this, speaking to the Philippian church. Remember, last week, if you were here, he had just talked about Christ's humility. And he says, therefore, my beloved... As you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world." holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. There is a lot of good meat inside of that passage, and we could camp there for the next six weeks, okay? But we're not going to. So I'm not going to hit everything in this passage. So if you're sitting back, don't worry, I didn't skip it. It's just there's so much, I can't hit all of it. Y'all with me? So here we go. First principle, I put it this way, work. The Apostle Paul says, work out your own salvation. Now we can sit back and say, what? What does Paul mean by working out your own salvation with fear and trembling? Well, first I'm going to share with you what it doesn't mean first. It doesn't mean that you can do enough good works to earn your salvation. It's not what it means. You can help as many old ladies across the street as you want to that will never earn your way into heaven. You can feed as many hungry people as possible that will never earn your way into heaven. There is nothing you can do to earn your salvation. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 4, by grace are you saved, not by works. There is nothing we do to activate faith in our life. There's nothing we could do to add to this salvation. It is all God's grace working in our hearts. It's him alone. It's not us. God does some of his works and we do some of our works and that's how we get saved. No, we are saved by God's grace alone. So what then is Paul talking about when he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And the idea of fear and trembling is the idea of you're working it out in awe and wonder 
of this great God who loves you. It's not being afraid like, oh, today I just lost my salvation because I I sinned yesterday. It's not the fear and trembling he's talking about. It's, hey, I'm going to work it out in awe and wonder of a great God who loves me. We have to remember that the Apostle Paul in this letter, he has been uh, ministering in the lives of this Philippian church. And he's getting ready to leave. And he wants them to know, hey guys, you know what? I'm leaving you guys. And I know I've been your spiritual leader. I know I've watched over for your souls. I know that I've showed you guys how to put the gospel into practice. I've demonstrated that for you. I've been able to come alongside you and encourage you in your faith. I've been able to show you how to put the gospel into practice in your marriage, in your jobs, in your everyday life. I've done that. You've seen me go to the temple and preach the gospel. I've been your primary spiritual leader. But now that he's leaving, he wants them to take responsibility to put the gospel into practice. And so when he says, work out your own salvation, what he's meaning is now for your maturity, you are mature enough for you to take responsibility for your spiritual welfare, your spiritual well-being. He says this, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. You see, Paul is leaving And he tells them, here's how you can continue to put the gospel into practice. Be obedient to God's leading. Listen to him just as when I was with you. He's telling each of us this morning that we have to take responsibility for putting the gospel into practice. He was telling them, you can no longer rely on me to do that. I'm going to be gone. You need to take that responsibility on yourself. And Paul knew that when he told them that, that there was going to be some fear and trepidation. They were going to sit back and say, but Paul, you were our spiritual mentor. You were our leader. How am I going to know what to do? And some of us this morning, when we hear we have to take responsibility to put the gospel into practice, we might sit back and say, Brad, I don't know how to do that. How am I supposed to accomplish that on my own? How do I take responsibility on myself when I feel like I'm immature in the faith? Paul knew we were going to ask these questions. And so he tells him this very next statement. Look at what he says in verse 13. He says, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now, I know the first time I read that statement, I didn't know what he was saying. And so I had to read it again. I felt like it was tongue-tied because it's for God works in you both to will and to work. And so I had to go back and say, what does Paul mean by both to will and to work? Another translation said it this way, that it is God working in us who will show us how to put the gospel into practice. And here's what he says, that God is working so deep in our lives that he will give you the desire to do good and he will give you the power to accomplish it. Now, sometimes we think that we're all alone in our spiritual life, that we need somebody else to be there to pour in 24 seven so that we can grow. But catch this, Paul is saying, Jesus, if you call Jesus Lord and Jesus has saved you, his spirit is working on such a deep level That he will, if you are just obedient and just ask him, he will give you the desire and the ability to accomplish it. This is how much our God loves us. And so he reminds him that it is not you accomplishing this on your own. It is God's spirit working in you. And as you trust him, as you work with him, you will see God begin to make changes in your life where you can begin to live on mission, where missional living will become a part of who you are. And so there's two areas that God is asking us to put the gospel into practice. The first is this, individually. Each and every single one of us that are Jesus' disciples We have to ask God, God, how do I, in my personal life, put the gospel into practice? What does it mean for us, for you, to work out your salvation individually? 
means each of us have to take responsibility for our spiritual life. Yes, we have pastors. Yes, we have elders. Yes, we have deacons. Yes, we have leaders. We have life group leaders. We have people who come alongside and do our women's one-on-one mentoring. Yes, all of these things are available. But at the end of the day, you have to take responsibility for yourself. We are here to help. We are here to guide. We are here to model. But at some point, you have to say, Jesus, I'm trusting your spirit. I'm trusting you to do this in me. Do what I need to do in my life life. Help me individually put this into practice. And sometimes we can sit back and say, well, if for me to grow and put the gospel into practice, that means I have to work harder, right? That means I need to exert more effort. And have you ever been in a place where you felt like you were putting forth all the effort and there was no change? Can anybody be honest with me this morning? You don't have to raise your hand. But I know I've been there where it's like I put all this effort like I'm going to do this, I'm going to wake up and I'm going to do that, I'm going to read 16 books today and I'm going to go out and I'm going to be a part of 99 conferences this year and then I'm really going to grow and then you're running around doing all these things and there's no change in your life. You want to know why? Because we were not made to do it in our effort. It is not our effort that changes us. What changes us is this, resting in God's wisdom, his guidance, and his leading. You might say, how's that? Go back to verse 12. He says, you see, my beloved, as you have always obeyed. Obeyed. You want to know the mark of maturity in a Christian's life? You want to know how you can put the gospel into practice every day? You want to know how you can take responsibility for living on mission? It is simply obey. You see, obedience is vital to working out our salvation. Paul says putting it into practice is just simply you sitting back saying, okay, God, where would you lead me? And whatever answer you give me, I will simply obey. Apostle Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians 10.5, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And catch this, and we take every thought captive to Christ. What is Paul saying? In other words, we have to lay down our entire life before God, before Jesus, and say, Jesus, what would you have me do in every area of my life? How can I take every area of my life and put the gospel into practice? And then when God gives you the answer, what do you do? You obey. Because God will give you the desire and the power to accomplish it. You see, another writer in scripture says it this way, if any of you lacks wisdom, ask God and he will give it to you. For us to be missional, for us to see life change, for us to individually grow to put the gospel into practice, we have to ask God, God, what would you have me do? And then obey. You might sit back and you say, Brad, okay, I get that. I ask God, how do I hear from God? Is God going to come on a loudspeaker? Is God going to send me a text message while I'm sitting, you know, in my car driving down the road? How does God speak? He speaks to us through prayer. Are you spending time in prayer? And sometimes, Dr. Hill, he said over and over again, sometimes you got to get in prayer and you got to shut up. Right? Sometimes we talk too much. How can we hear God if we're always the one talking? We say, God, how do I put this gospel into practice at my work? Be quiet, be still, and wait for God's leading. Secondly, God speaks to us through his word. And as you read his word, his spirit will teach you. His spirit will illuminate. And as you ask God, how do I put this gospel into practice? And as you read scripture, he will make it clear to you. And so we got to take responsibility to work out our salvation. We take every thought. And so you can sit back and say, okay, here's, ask God how to put the, the gospel into practice in your marriage. Ask him how to put it into practice with your thought life. Ask him how to put it into practice with your job, raising your children, dealing with conflict, setting boundaries, resisting temptations. And I could make the list go on and on, but what's the point? Is that we have to bathe our entire lives in prayer and then sit back and rest in God's saving power in our life. And wherever he leads, we obey. The writer of Hebrews says it this way, God will equip you with everything 
What's that word that I just say? With everything, everything that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You don't have to worry, well, I don't know if I'm strong enough. You're not, but the spirit is stronger. You see, the spirit lives inside of us. Let's rest in that truth that he will do it in our lives. Let's bathe our life in prayer and sit back and say, God, I can't, but you can help me to do it. This is why the apostle Paul says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, he says, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. And so we work out our salvation individually by resting in God's power to work it out in us. We must, not work, we must work out our salvation, not just individually, but here's the second thing I put in my notes. I said it this way. We need to put it, work it out in community. You see, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church of, at Philippi as a collective whole, and he tells them, beloved, you must work out your own salvation And he's talking to the whole church, the local church, that body of believers who were together caring for one another, praying for one another, studying God's word together. And so here he's speaking to the whole church. And so us as individuals, we got to ask God, God, how do I work out my salvation within a local church? In our case, how do we work out? How do we put the gospel into practice at Hollywood Community Church? You see, the Spirit has given all of Jesus' disciples a gift or gifts, talent or talents to use for the church to grow. And each of us are a part of the same body. You here have a part to play at Hollywood Community Church. You matter to the church. You are needed in this church. For what? For us to grow together, for us to be built up, for us to encourage that each of us have a gift and talent that God has given us. And Peter says it this way, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. We are all part of the same body. Yes, we're individuals, but God has given us gifts and talents that we must and should and need to use to serve this local body of believers. If you call Hollywood Community Church your home, your family, we need everybody to use their gifts in this church. Why? Because for us to function properly, for us to grow and be all that God has called this local body of believers to be, it takes everybody working together. And there's not one gift that's more important than another. Some people say the pastor is the most important position in the church. No, it's not. Paul even says that, that the pinky toe is just as valuable as the head, that the gifts you don't see are just as valuable. So if you're like, hey, I can vacuum really good, you're the best vacuumer at this church, that is just as important as the person standing up here teaching God's word. Your gift matters. There's no one better than other, and it takes everybody working together for this whole church to grow and be healthy and be spiritually all that God has called us to be. And so I want you to hear my heart on this. I'm going to make just a couple statements, but my heart is not mm, this, okay? I'm not a mean teacher. I'm not doing this because God has had to do this to me. So when I say this, please understand my heart. It's out of love. It's out of grace because this is what Paul tells the church, and we need to hear it too, okay? I want you to catch this. When we choose not to use our gift, our church family suffers. I really want you to let that sink in. When we choose not to use our gifts, our church family suffers. Our mission suffers. We're on God's mission. And if all of us are not using our gifts, we're going to encounter hurdles and obstacles to carrying out God's mission. Everyone is vital to this mission. You see, God has called us to use our gifts not sit on our gifts. Tells Timothy, fan into flame the gift that God has given you. Why? Because your gift matters. 
Sometimes we look at it and it's not intentional. We can look up and let's say we look up on the stage for worship and every Sunday we have a worship team and they lead us in worship. We can sit back and say, oh, they have a worship team, I'm not needed. Or we have a children's ministry, children go, they're taught, they don't need me. They have everything that they need. Here's the thing, it's, that's not the truth. It's not true practically and it's not true biblically. There is never a point in time where God says, I've given you these gifts, but only use them when you're needed. Jesus says the opposite, the laborers are few. Pray that God would send laborers into the harvest. So what, what's the idea? Imagine church, if all 400 of us in here this morning said we are going to use the gifts God has given to us. Imagine what God could do through Hollywood Community Church. Imagine this, if everybody used their gifts, widows and orphans would be taken care of. Hungry would be fed. Poor would be cared for. Addicts would be set free. The lost would be found. The rejected would be accepted. And souls would be saved. Your gift matters to this church, and when we don't use it, our church family suffers. It takes all of us working together, using the gifts and talents to accomplish God's mission in this world. We need each other, we need your gift. And some of you might sit back and say, Brad, I don't know my gift. I get it. There was a while I didn't know mine either. But then somebody says, hey, would you want to serve for a puppet ministry? I said, yes. And through that, God revealed my gifts and talents. And so I say that to say this. If somebody asks you to do something, do it and see. Because God will always reveal as long as we obey his leading. And so how do you fit into this community of believers? You got to pray and ask God about it. God, what are my gifts and talents? How can I plug in? Because if all of us would use our gifts and talents, we would see God do amazing things through this local body of believers. Let's become a church that works out our salvation individually as well as in community. Here's the second thing I put in my notes. The second principle Paul points out is this. I just put it simply as shine. And I'll show you where that word comes from. In verses four through 16, the apostle Paul says this. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Paul tells us that to be on mission, we must shine. So what does Paul mean by we have to shine as lights in the world? Here's, our lives should be noticeably, noticeably different than those around us, right? We should not look the same. We should not act the same. There should be a difference that when people look at us. And then he tells them, do everything without grumbling and complaining. And part of that is he's reminding us, like, don't be like Israel when God delivered them from Egypt and they came out and they whine and complain oh God why did you bring us out of Egypt that was so much better and they argue with God and they argue with Moses he's saying don't be like that that's what the rest of the world does the world just complains they're they're bitter they just they just want stuff now and they just can't handle having to just trust God and so he says be different because Israel wasn't different and they led into disobedience which led them into idolatry and they got into frivolous disputes and arguments so he says be different don't dispute, don't get into arguments. And then he says, not only that, but don't have any blemish. And what does that mean? That means live in such a way that the world doesn't have anything to accuse you of. You ever hear from people that don't go to church, that don't know God, and they say the reason they don't go to church is because the church is full of hypocrites? Okay, this is what Paul is saying. Live your life without blemish so that when people look at Christians, they'll be attracted to the church instead of repelled from the church. He says that us shining as light should be an attraction. People should look at our lives and say, wow, what is happening with here? What kind of person are you? 
why do you do the things that you do? You see, this idea of shining is not new to Jesus. It's all the way back to Israel. God tells Israel in Isaiah 49, you can look it up later, verse 6, he says, Israel, I'm going to call you to be a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. And then you have Israel who was supposed to do that and they couldn't live up to it. They made life all about themselves. They grumbled and complained. Daniel 12, 3, I came across this passage while I was studying this week, and I want you to catch this because this is huge for our understanding of what it means to be a light. It says this, and those who are wise, and that word wise means those who are able to share, to understand God's word, and then share it with somebody else. That's what wise means. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Those who are wise Those who shine are those who share the good news of what God is doing in the world to others and giving the good news to others. So there's this idea that being the light is us, not just obeying God, not just working out our salvation, but it's us bringing the message of the gospel to the lost, to those who don't know God. You see, then you see with Jesus' life, the apostle John says this in John chapter 1, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines where? In the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. And to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. In John chapter 8, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And when you look at Jesus' life, did Jesus just sit among the Pharisees and the religious leaders and just had church? No, when you looked at Jesus' life, he was always among the outcasts. He was always among the rejected. He even got accused, why are you eating with sinners, Jesus? And Jesus said, I didn't come here to reach the healthy. Came to the sick. Came to those who were lost came to the broken, I came to the hurting, I came for the poor, I came to those that the rest of the world has rejected so I can bring them life. And then Jesus gathered his disciples around him and told them that he would be leaving soon. And he tells them that you are gonna do greater things than I did. And you're gonna go out in the world, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And he said they were to continue the work that he had started. So I want you to catch this. To share the light, to be the light, to shine as lights, we have to engage those who are walking in darkness. We must bring the good news everywhere in all areas of our lives so that we can walk in the light. Because to walk in the light is to live on mission. John, the the disciple, he said it this way. If you say you walk in the light, but you hate your brother, You are in darkness, but if you love your brother, then you are in the light. And so what John is saying is, look, if we say we are Jesus' disciples, if we say we're in the light, then we have to bring the light to those that are lost. Are you all with me this morning? You see, there are many in churches all around that think to shine as lights means we come to church. That's a good thing. We're in a life group, it's a great thing. We listen to the Christian radio, it's a great thing. We go to Christian conferences, that's a great thing. But we don't engage the world. Those things are great, but you are not shining as a light. You see, let me illustrate what I mean by that. Have you ever had somebody, imagine this, that I set up my house with Christmas lights and the only time I turned my lights on was during the day. How noticeable are my lights? You're gonna be like, Brad, like, can you please not turn them on during the day? Turn them on at night so we can see what your lights look like. I got a picture here uh, we're gonna show you. One is a tree that's lit up during the day. There's little lights on it. But then when the light is in the darkness, you can see the difference. Y'all with me? God did not say, I'm going to call you to be the light and just hang out with lights. 
The lights have to go to the darkness. That's where the difference is going to be. As you go out into the workplaces, into the publixes, into Starbucks, into Burger King, wherever you find yourself, when they see your life, that's when the world is going to say, wait a minute, you guys love differently. You forgive differently. You give mercy differently. You give grace differently. You speak differently. You serve differently. You honor differently. You work differently. Why is that? Because you're engaging the darkness. You're showing them that there is a God who loves them and that there is a way of life that doesn't make sense to the rest of the world. And the reason why it doesn't make sense, the only reason we understand is because of what Jesus has done in our life and what Jesus can do in your life. You see, God has called us to be a light and we must engage the darkness. So how do we practically shine as lights in the world? How do I put the gospel into practice in my daily life? Here's the beautiful thing. God will always use you the way that you are wired and the way he created you to be. See, I could stand up here and say, Monday, tomorrow, go to Starbucks, have a gospel conversation. Tuesday, go door to door, just cold turkey, knock on doors and ring the doorbell. Wednesday, I want you to spend time at the library and see if you can share the gospel in a whisper. Thursday, I want you to go out to Publix and share... God has not created all of us in that way. And that's the beautiful thing, that God is going to always use us to put the gospel into practice in people's lives the way that he made us, the way that it's comfortable. Some people, it might just be them saying, hey, you know what? We're going to church at Howard Community Church, and I'd love for you to join. It's great. Some people, it's going to build a relationship with somebody, invite them into their home, and then share their faith. Some people, like Howard Barnard, when he was here, he would go cold turkey up to people. But what's the point? It's that the, the possibilities are limitless because each of us are unique and each of us are different. But the message is always the same. The message never changes, but the methods do. And so you have to sit back and say, okay, well, how is God going to call me to share the gospel? Remember what I said. It's resting in God's power, waiting for God's leading, and then when he whispers it, it's obeying it. You see, I'm going to share a few stories just to kind of give some examples. Um, A couple days ago, we played a... uh, Atlanta Christian School in basketball, our girls team did. And before the game, the other coach came over to me and he said, hey, um, I normally always bring a book on prayer that I give to the other coach to give to their best player. He's like, I forgot my book. I can send it to you at another time. And so to me, that stuck out to me because he's not just playing Christian schools. He's playing schools that are public schools that people are far from God in every game. He's walking out. He's a pastor of a church, and he's walking out, handing a book on prayer to another coach to give to one of their players. What is he doing? He's just being obedient to this desire that God put in his heart. Now, is God going to call us to do that every time? No. But he was obedient to what God has led him to do. A pastor friend of mine shared a story about how he took one of his members on a mission trip. And while he was over there, this guy's a barber and he was giving free haircuts to people. I forget where they went, what country it was, but he was giving free haircuts. And then when they got back, he met with my friend and he said, hey, you know what? Um, I, I sat back and said, I went on a mission trip and cut hair. I really feel like God is telling me I should do the same thing here. So he got another friend of his, and she cuts hair. And so now at their food pantry every week, they give out free haircuts. You see, and what is that? It's these people saying, God, what would you have me to do? They have the talent. People need their haircut that want it, I guess. But they're doing that, and they're loving on people, and they're being the hands and feet of Jesus. You see, for me, I have to wrestle with this too. I got to say, God, how can I put the gospel into practice? How can my wife put the gospel into practice? So about a year ago, God just put on my heart, hey, I want you to stick to one person who cuts your hair. Because I used to go into the barber shop, first available, because I don't have time to sit in this shop, right? But then God said, you know what? Pick one person, build a relationship with that person. So for the last year, I stuck with the same girl. And now I would love to say she gave her life to the Lord. But we have conversations. We talk about her life. She knows I'm, I'm one of the pastors here at this church. And so my hope is that God would use me just as something as simple as that to share the good news with someone. Kelly, she's investing in her team. She's built community with her team. And now that 
group of people are going to her when trouble time comes. And it's all because she sat back and said, okay, God, how can you use me? And we have to wrestle with this. The last one I'll share is this, is that I know that there are people at this church who have befriended unbelievers, invited them into their homes, shared the good news with them, and their lives were changed. And there are people in this church that are saying, okay, God, whatever I'm doing, use me. You see, one of the main things that we always forget about is that sometimes we think that to be in ministry, I have to be a pastor, or I have to serve at a church. But you are living on mission when God sends you out into your workplace. You might sit back and say, well, Brad, I, I'm an accountant. You are on mission as an accountant. God is using your workplace to be a mission field. Be the best thing you can be at your job, right? I mean, when you do your job with excellence, other people respect it and they'll come to you and it'll give you the opportunity to speak into their life. And so if you're a banker, if you're a cashier, if you're a police officer, if you drive for Uber, whatever it is, be excellent at it and say, God, how can I use my job to speak the gospel into somebody's life and then be obedient and do it? I'm going to close with this. The last thing is this, and I'm just going to give you three quick things. The last thing is apply. And I got this from a pastor, Tim Keller. And so here's three areas that today you might say, okay, what do I do today? What do I do for this next week? Take these three things and ask God, how do you apply the gospel in these three areas? The first is this, share the gospel message in your circle of influence. We all have friends, family, coworkers that don't know Jesus. Pray and say, God, how do I share the gospel with them? What is that opportunity? Show me when is the right time. Secondly, Love your neighbors. Ask God, how do I love my neighbors? Is it making them a pie and giving it to them? Is it inviting them over for dinner? Is it, you know, mowing their grass for free? Whatever it is, say, God, how do I love my neighbors? How do I seek justice in my city? And then lastly, ask God, how do I engage the world through my faith and my vocation, my job? How do I do that? And every day, bathe yourself in prayer, and God will give you what to do. And then simply obey. And rest knowing you will never do it in your own power. You will never do it in your strength. You will have God's spirit backing you, behind you, doing it in your life. And as we close, we're going to sing a worship song in just a moment. But I want you to look around all this auditorium. And I want you to look at the empty chair in the auditorium. I was going to bring a pew down, but I'm not that strong. So if you're in the balcony, look around at the pews up there. But... When we see the empty chair, I want you to realize that this represents someone who is walking in darkness. This represents somebody who is far from God, who doesn't know God. And as you look around, there's quite a bit of empty seats. You see, our mission is so important. Why? Because it's heaven and hell for people who are walking in darkness. The Bible says that every person is on one of two roads. You're either on the path that leads to eternal life or you're on the path to destruction, on the path to hell. And so why do we live on mission? Because Jesus was willing to give his life to save people who were on the road to hell, which is all of us. And Jesus gave up everything and said, I'm going to bleed and die on that cross so they can know freedom, so they can know me, so they can be my child and I will be their God. And we need to have the same heartbeat to say, man, we're not going to the lost so that we can have more people in our church. We're not going there so we can say, wow, we're a church of a thousand. No, that's not the point. The point of going to the lost is so they can become saved that they could meet their savior. That's the point. And we have to be 24 seven, it has to be burning in our hearts that people are on the road to heaven or they're on the road to hell. And if they're on the road to hell, we're gonna tell them Jesus is Lord. Repent, believe. And so let your heart be, be this as well. Let your prayer be, Jesus, create a burden in me for the lost like you had. Because when we finally realize how important it is and how serious it is, we will live on mission 
in all areas of our lives.